Welcome to the BioCanRx and N2 webinar on cancer clinical staff. My name is Renee LeDuc and I work for BioCanRx, a network of centers of excellence that fund strategic research in the development of effective cancer immunotherapies in Canada. Our vision is to enhance the quality of life of those living with cancer. In addition to supporting research, this also includes partnering and working together with organizations like N2 and the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation to create tools that help raise awareness about cancer clinical trials and tools that build capacity in serving and supporting people living with cancer. The Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation, N2, and BioCanRx have a shared interest in building this capacity so that more people can access clinical trials. This webinar was designed and developed for the cancer coaches at the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation. And I'm so pleased to have with us today Dr. Natasha Kekri from the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, Faye Axelman from the Canadian Cancer Clinical Trials Network and the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center, Jill Hammer Wilson, who has participated in a clinical trial, and Don Richards from N2. The Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation cancer coaches are also here with us around the table. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the collaborative nature of this webinar. The cancer coaches, our guest speakers, Don Richard, Joanna Weiss from the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation, and myself have been working very closely together from project conception to today to design, develop, and deliver this webinar. It has been a real honor and a pleasure to have worked together with you all, and I wish to thank you for this. It also gives me great pleasure to be here with you all today to launch our webinar. I will now hand over the microphone to Don Richards from NQ. Okay, thank you, Renee. Um, so I'm Don, and um, I saw most of you at the beginning. Uh, just to let you know, I represent an organization um, whose logo you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner of the slides called the Network of Networks, or N2 as it's also known. N2 is a national not-for-profit organization um, that represents members across the country who conduct clinical research and clinical trials. And our mandate is really to help them do high quality uh, research and um, to provide them with tools and resources to make their job easier, to help provide them a national voice so we can advocate together on issues that are important to clinical research and clinical trials and to help um, leverage national and provincial initiatives so that we can collectively use those across the country. Um, i just like to point out that BioCanRx and the Ottawa Hospital are also members of N2. And Renee, could you flip to the next slide? I think I'll go through the agenda quickly. So this is to just let people know what today's agenda is. So obviously, Renee and I have just welcomed you and told you a little bit about the webinar today. Um, as Renee said, Dr. Kekri will be doing a bit of an introduction to clinical trials. Um, Faye Asplin from the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center will be talking about the coordination of clinical trials and what people as participants um, might be able to expect if they're considering. Um, Jill Hamer Wilson will talk about her own experiences as being a clinical trial participant. Faye and myself will present some N2 and Ottawa Hospital resources um, that are available to the public and so the cancer coaches may want to use these. And then um, Renee, because she's in person, will um, moderate some questions and we'll do a quick wrap up at the end of things too. So we have a little bit of the whole process for you that we'll be walking through today. Um, and it is my pleasure now to pass things over to uh, Dr. Kekri, who is um, at the Ottawa Hospital and the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. She's already introduced that she is a hematologist and she is a specialist in uh, early phase um, clinical trials. So I'll pass it over to her to give a bit of an introduction now to clinical trials. Dr. Kekri? Thanks, Don. Um, so as you heard, I'm Natasha Kekri. I'm a hematologist at the Ottawa Hospital. Um, I run clinical trials and I also 
um, enroll patients on them. I also have work in the preclinical work in the lab with mouse models. Um, and my research and my clinical work focuses on leukemia, lymphoma, uh, and bone marrow transplant, but nowadays, due to my lab work, seems to extend to all tumor types. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about clinical trials, why we do them, uh, what are cancer clinical trials, and why someone might participate in them, and I hope that you find this useful. So essentially for clinical trials, anyone, whether healthy or ill, can uh, think about participating in a clinical trial. There's lots of trials that we run for specific types of cancer, for example, but there's also lots of trials that we run for healthy volunteers. Um, and both of them have uh, different goals and different questions, but both have uh, value and can help us further the field of research. And today I'll specifically um, focus this talk on cancer trials, but a lot of what I'm saying pertains to really any clinical trial that a patient can or a person can participate in. So by participating in a clinical trial, you can help yourself, you can help someone you know or someone that you love, um, a family member or a friend or someone else. Um, and we, you can help find new treatments, which is what people think of, I think, the most when they think about clinical trials. So um, when participating in a clinical trial, there's lots of different questions that researchers will try to ask and try to answer. Uh, and different goals will lead to different designs of a clinical trial. And, and people who participate in clinical trials learn about this as they go through the clinical trial process. So one of our goals is to find therapies that are safe. So really looking for side effects that we think are reasonable, um, and researchers want to make sure these treatments are safe before we uh, can, can go along the path of thinking that it might be a treatment that we can use for in the mainstream for patients. Uh, we also want to make sure we have the right target, so uh, the right use of whatever we're testing in a clinical trial. So we're trying to find new ways and new uh, methods to use either existing therapies or perhaps bring them to different uh, people. And so we look for what is the best use of something. And for the most part, we're talking about a certain therapy, but uh, it can be all kinds of things. It could be a new test for a patient, for example. Um, the most obvious thing that people think of in a clinical trial is that we're looking for the best treatments that are available. So comparing two or more therapies and trying to see which one might be better, um, and there's lots and lots of ways that you can do this, but that's a very common, I think when people think of clinical trials, that's what they think about, trying to find something new that might be better than what we already have. And looking for the right patients. So I try not to use the word patients because that implies that, um, you know, that we don't do trials with healthy volunteers, but um, all people can participate in, health, in trials. And I think trials are not just about patients, they're about the patients' caregivers and support systems and a whole team that goes into participating in a trial, including cancer coaches. So I think, um, you know, we're trying to find the right people to be involved and the right people to put onto these trials. And we test different groups, and, and specifically talking about patients with cancer, for example, we do test therapies in different ways in different groups uh, to see if a therapy we think might be new and useful is beneficial to all groups of patients or maybe just to one specific group. And so we might test that specifically in a clinical trial. So how do clinical trials work? So I guess we should all be on the same page about what a clinical trial is before I say how they work. So clinical trials are studies that involve people um, and are a type of research, in this case clinical, so clinical implying that we're testing it on humans. Uh, we usually call um, data where we're collecting information or experiments on animals or in the petri dish, we call that preclinical work or lab research. So clinical implies that we're, we're testing patients or people. Um, they're carried out, as I've already said, to test new therapies, to discover how we could prevent or diagnose a specific disease, learn how an illness might affect a person's life or a person's um, family's life, for example, and provide information specifically about a disease. We might learn more about a disease in a clinical trial. And each clinical trial doesn't have to specifically address only one of these things. We often look at many of these things in the same clinical trial. So in terms of the different types of trials that we have, we have prevention trials looking at new ways to prevent um, disease. So specifically in the cancer space, uh, we're often looking to diagnose things earlier and earlier in order to prevent progression, for example. Um, in screening trials, we're trying to uh, 
So actually, sorry, that's more of a screening trial where you're trying to detect the disease earlier and earlier before it might be clinically obvious to a person. Uh, prevention trials are more to prevent the disease altogether. Um, and that, you know, things like smoking cessation studies and other things where we think we have a, a risk factor for a cancer, for example, the prevention studies would work on trying to prevent or modulate those things before a patient wants to develop something like cancer. And then treatment trials, which we've spoken about, which are basically to test new therapies that might benefit a patient with cancer. Again, here I'm specifically talking about cancer because that's the mandate of today, but these really, these types of trials apply to really any disease out there. So I'll try to slow down for this part because this is where I think um, there's a lot more um, information that we should talk about. So how do the actual trials run? So clinical trials take a long time and a lot of steps to get into clinical use outside of a clinical trial. Uh, once all that preclinical work is done and we think that there's maybe promise with a new therapy, we go through these phases of a clinical trial. And I'll try to outline each phase in a lot of, in some detail. Participants in a clinical trial are followed very closely through each phase, and often their follow-up can be quite long sometimes to look for any effects that we might not expect with a, a new therapy, for example. And we use information from one phase of a trial to, to um, determine or dictate how we do the next phase of a clinical trial. Um, and when I explain the phases, that will make sense as to how one part can determine the next part. And Usually we would only move to the next step of the trial if the first part um, passes our minimum standard. So when I talk about phase one and safety, if we pass a certain standard, that's when we would maybe consider a phase two or a phase three trial. So we really usually can only move a trial forward to the next phase if the phase before it has worked out uh, well. So phase one, so this is, um, the focus of new, I would say, new therapies that have never been tested in humans before, uh, we do a phase one trial where basically the most important factor here is to look for safety. So we're trying to determine if something is safe, how much of the drug or the therapy needs to be given, and what are the side effects. So in a lot of phase one trials, we do something called dose escalation. So if it's a new therapy that's never been given to a patient before, we might not know what that therapy will do to a patient. So we will start at a lowest dose that we think is safe. Um, and if that dose is safe, then we move up to a higher dose. And we keep moving up until we hit what we call our maximum toxicity threshold or maximum uh, tolerated dose is what it's called. Um, and so that's how the phase one would move until we reach a dose where we think side effects, we can't go any further in terms of side effects. Or we think this is our feeling anyways of effective dose and we're still within our safety profile. So that's what we're testing and usually in a phase one. And so side effects are the most important thing or any toxicity from the therapy is really the most important thing for us to watch for. And if we get too toxic of, of an effect, that's when we would stop. And so if, if things are too toxic, we wouldn't move on to a phase two, for example, if the therapy can So in terms of phase two, um, then we're starting to now look for an effectiveness signal. So first we look for safety. Now we want to see, does this therapy actually work? So in the first phase, we might treat up to 30 patients. Um, some phase one trials can be very small, just 10 patients. But a phase two trial really depends on the therapy, how big the trial will be. Um, in cardiology, for example, you know, if we're testing something um, to prevent heart attacks, we need to test a lot of people. A phase two can be hundreds of patients. But in the cancer world, that's generally smaller. So we're usually testing somewhere between 20 and 100 patients. Uh, and that's just because, you know, these therapies can be very cumbersome, they can be complicated, and a phase two, it might not take that many patients to see a signal that this therapy might work. So in this type of study, we still watch very closely for safety and the dose again. So again, we're still looking at side effects and toxicity because it's more patients where we can follow those outcomes. But now we're starting to see if the therapy works. And the outcome we look for in this study can, is completely dependent on what the investigators want to um, examine. And so, for example, it can be uh, time to relapse of your disease or when the cancer comes back. It can be a simple survival curve. It can be a simple signal that this drug, when we take out some, a patient's blood, it looks like it's working. It's, it's 
doing what we would expect it to do in the blood. So the actual outcome in a phase two is completely dependent on the trial and how we design it. But again, we're trying to find something that tells us this drug might actually work for this specific cancer. Or this therapy, I shouldn't say just drug because we do this with all kinds of new cellular type therapies that are not just a drug specifically. Um, and if you deal with the auto hospital enough, you'll see lots of interesting things that are not just drugs. So once you have a phase two, and so now you know some safety outcomes, you feel comfortable that this drug is safe, or the therapy, and then you find that it looks like it might actually help this cancer. When you only have 20 to 100 patients, that's probably not enough to say it will work compared to whatever our standard of care might be. And so it wouldn't be enough in a phase two trial to say this drug should become mainstream and we should fund it and we should give it to patients. We need more data than that. So we usually move on at that point to a bigger phase three study. And the biggest difference between a phase two and a phase three study is that the phase two study has really no comparator usually. There's no control arm or a placebo arm to say or um, a, a comparison basically. We're just looking for a signal with that new therapy. Whereas in the phase three, we're really trying to compare different things, whether it's to the standard of care, whether it's two new drugs being compared to see which might be better than the other. There's all kinds of comparisons we do. When we try to compare things, to actually statistically find a difference between the two, because it might not be super obvious when you look at two response rates that one is different than the other. We have to power our study to actually look at that difference. And to do that, you need a lot of patients. And that's why phase three trials are generally much bigger than a phase two trial. And a phase three trial, again, can be, in the cancer population, can be hundreds of patients to thousands of patients because, again, the more patients we can accrue, the more we can look at that comparison. The reason that range is so high is that, as many of you know, working in the cancer field, some of our cancers that we deal with are very rare. And so if we were to wait on thousands of patients, we might never get that therapy into mainstream, right? And so a lot of our phase three trials in the cancer population are going to be smaller than what you would see in something like a big trial about heart attacks or a trial about asthma or something like that, which is much more prevalent in our population than some of the cancers that we deal with. So basically, again, you know, really we're still looking at safety, we're still looking at therapy effectiveness, but now we're trying to use more participants so that we can get a better understanding of those things and hopefully compare it to another therapy. So then we do, so phase three is usually enough for us to try to go to the Ministries of Health in Canada um, to get something um, entered into our mainstream therapies for a patient. And so usually once we have phase three data and we can say, look, this looks at least as good as our standard of care or it looks like our standard therapies, um, then it helps us to get something into the mainstream for patients outside of clinical trials. But we usually still want more information, and especially when we're dealing with pharmaceutical companies, we do need to figure out if the price point we're given makes sense. And it, it really is awful in the world of cancer to have to talk about price, but the reality is we're a public funded system, and, and especially in Canada, we really do want to make sure that the price point makes sense, because if we're spending $20 million and we're extending life by maybe two months, that's, you know, we do need to understand those numbers. It doesn't mean we, we wouldn't do it, it just means we need to understand it. So to understand it, we often do phase four trials. So in phase four trials, we're trying to figure out sort of after the fact, once we know there's a good signal with this therapy, we're trying to figure out more about it. So sometimes that involves um, post, we say, we say post uh, uh, marketing analysis. So we do a marketing analysis sometimes or a cost effectiveness analysis. We might also do um, uh, studies where we take the same therapy and we use it in a different population. So especially if we think the safety profile will be the same, we might move that trial into another group of maybe a different cancer or not cancer, a different therapy, a different disease altogether. Um, and we would do that in a phase four setting because you wouldn't start again at that small phase one when you have all of that useful data that you've already collected. Um, and so we often will do that. The other part of a phase four is you can often get long-term effects of the therapy. So, you know, phase threes have a very set definition of time and, and we don't want to make them forever so that we can get those drugs into the mainstream. But in a phase four, we can really follow sometimes those same patients or new patients, we can follow them for a longer period of time and see if there's effects that we hadn't accounted for in those shorter trials. So where do clinical trials happen? So it really obviously depends on where the research is being done, but I would say that it's anywhere that a patient has access to um, 
uh, people within the medical community. So this can be in a doctor's office. It's, of course, within our hospitals and our academic centers. Um, it can be in medical centers that are private. Uh, it can be in uh, it's most, I have to say, probably nursing is one of our biggest, um, uh, is the most face time that a patient gets is with the nursing support staff that they have. And so it can often be with any nursing facility that patients are exposed to. So for me, it would be a medical daycare unit where they don't necessarily see a physician, but they're seeing lots of nursing. It can be in a community nursing station. It can be with a home care nurse. It can really be anywhere uh, where a patient interacts with the medical community. Um, and like I said, academic centers, so often universities that our hospitals are affiliated with, so in Ottawa, it would be the University of Ottawa, there's research happening uh, at the University of Ottawa, and they might reach out to us to recruit patients depending on what they're studying, um, and, and vice versa. We might have, a tr I might have a therapy that I want the university to participate in, and vice versa. So we have that connection. Obviously, any clinic space. Um, and then in terms of your home, some of the studies that we run often don't require you to take a therapy. It might be that a patient needs to do a survey. It might be that a patient needs blood withdrawn by their home trainer. So it can, some of the stuff can happen in the house. Um, although I would say the majority of it happens when the interface with the medical community, but patients and families um, can often do some of the research part of it right at, in their home. So who is involved? So I said participant. Like I said, it's not always, you know, in our situation we often think of cancer patients, but it's often their entire family in part of the trial. Uh, principal investigator is the sort of leader of the trial. It's usually the person who had the idea. It's the person who brings the idea forward, submits all the ethics applications and the regulatory documents, and is sort of the head of the trial. It's usually the physician in charge of the trial or the scientist in charge of the trial. Uh, the clinical research coordinator, so I think today we'll talk more about that, but basically we have, without them, the physicians would never accomplish anything. We're not that useful on our own. Uh, so we have lots of people who do all of the clinical um, research work for us, so who help to find the patients, who help to coordinate things, who help to get all the testing we need done, all the therapies done at the right time. Um, and without them, we, we wouldn't actually run those trials, which is why a lot of clinical trials have to be run at bigger hospitals or bigger centers, and that can be frustrating for patients, but that, you know, we have those resources there for them, which is why they often happen in bigger centers. So other members of the team, so we talked about nursing, uh, nutrition, social worker, physiotherapy, um, occupational therapy, all kinds of people can be involved depending on the type of trial it is, depending on how difficult the therapy might be. There's all kinds of people that we like to in involve because the more we have involved, the more support the patient has, the better the trial will go for everybody. Uh, we often have sponsors. So sponsors can be uh, public or private. So CIHR is, is the big um, public funder of clinical trials in the country, I would say, uh, but they are, you know, government funded, so they don't have an infinite amount of money. So we have lots of other organizations. I personally get funding from BioCanerec to run some of our clinical work, um, and we have uh, pharmaceutical companies or other industry sponsors as well uh, who can help run and sponsor a trial because these things can be very expensive because we need patients to have lots of visits to to wherever they're getting their um, clinical trial conducted, um, and lots of testing, and lots of, things goes, goes, lots of things go into a trial. So it can be very expensive. And so there's lots of sponsors that get involved. The ethics board is uh, usually at each hospital, although we do have a provincial one and a national one as well. But basically, the ethics board uh, makes sure that the patients are protected, or the people involved in the trial are protected, and that what we're doing is ethical and not um, unethical, I guess. Um, and lastly, the, like I said, the families and caregivers, because at the end of the day, um, they're, you know, hugely important in these things happening and the participants being successful in getting supported throughout the whole thing. And I think cancer coaches probably <coughs> a little bit into that realm as well, is that, you know, patients and participants need a lot of support through these clinical trials, especially in the cancer domain. Um, so there's a huge team that we involve for a clinical trial. Let's go through how we actually get through the trial or what we can expect. So um, the first part is really patients and families of patients. I say this to my patients all the time, and I, I still think they sometimes struggle with it, to feel comfortable at any time to ask a physician or a healthcare team member or a clinical trial person about anything, whether it's about a clinical trial they heard about that they've never heard about before, whether it's about other options they don't know exist and they want to know what's out there. 
want, or maybe it is a clinical trial that was offered to them and they have more questions and they haven't enrolled, they really should feel comfortable to ask questions. And I know uh, that can be difficult uh, at times, but I think that, especially in the cancer domain, uh, I think at the end of the day, I think the more questions you ask, the more answers you'll get. And even if you feel frustrated, I think that's really important that patients and families uh, feel comfortable. And sometimes if you don't feel comfortable or, or if the patient and the family doesn't feel comfortable asking those questions to one person, they might feel comfortable asking someone else in the team. So uh, especially cancer patients, I feel like they do interact with a lot of different team members. Um, and so you can ask, you know, the nurse who's giving chemo, you can ask the clerk at the front desk, you can ask anyone who you interact with, and hopefully someone along that line can help you in, in navigating clinical trials a little bit. So uh, then we determine, so let's, once, once we've asked questions and we've, we've thought about a clinical trial that might benefit a certain person, uh, then we have to talk about whether that trial is actually going to be useful, and so, or is, is an option, I should say, not necessarily useful, we don't always know when we're starting. So, in clinical trials, it's really important that um, patients and teams involved with a patient understand that even if a clinical trial is out there, not everyone's going to be eligible for that clinical trial. And remember how I talked about phase one and phase two trials, it's really about safety, right? We need to make sure that these therapies are safe before we move on to mainstream. So phase one, two, and even three, we have to make sure that they're safe. And so we will pick, it might seem like we carve out a very specific niche of patients that can be eligible, but it's for good reason. It's because, you know, we're looking for those safety outcomes and we don't want to be overly risky in that first phase of a trial. And so not all patients will be eligible. So first thing we have to figure out is if a patient would be eligible for the clinical trial. And that's usually figured out by the physician taking care of that patient, um, or, or it might be determined centrally by uh, the principal investigator that we talked about earlier. They might have to, the physician might have to apply to that principal investigator, figure out if a patient can be eligible, and then enroll them in the trial. Um, I am a medical monitor for um, some bone marrow transplant studies in the U.S., and I get sent electronic referrals, basically making sure that patients who are referred by another physician, that me, who's more objective, I don't know that patient, uh, knows if they would meet the criteria to enter the trial. So it's not always just the physician taking care of the patient. So let's say we determine that a patient is eligible, then we move on to informed consent. Um, and that is done with paperwork. So <laughs> there's always paperwork involved for consent. Um, and it's really to ensure that the patient and the families involved um, feel comfortable in understanding what they're getting into and that um, they consent to the risks and possible benefits of what they're going to encounter in a clinical trial. Um, and I'd like to make a point that at each point in this arrow, ask questions applies to all of them. So, you know, patients and healthcare teams and cancer coaches can ask questions all throughout this process. And informed consent is a very good time to ask questions. And I tell my patients, if they didn't ask you questions at the informed consent, I either don't know if they read it, and I don't know if they understood it, because consent, I, I can't imagine patients wouldn't have questions when they read consent, and my patients know that I expect them to come with questions when they read consent. Um, so if they consent and they agree to it and everybody is comfortable to move forward, then we start the clinical trial. Uh, and once we get through the clinical trial, we'll talk more in detail about that in a second, um, we have a complete date of the clinical trial, and patients are not enrolled forever, for the most part, there's a handful of exceptions to that for some long-term clinical trials, but for the most part, there's an end date for them. So I think I've been saying this all along, but I'll go through this a little bit, the potential benefits and risks. So I think the risks are much clearer to patients. You know, this is something that has an unclear benefit for a patient and can have risky side effects, and in some situations, we might not even know what those side effects can be. Um, it means, it can mean a change in treatment, so for some patients, uh, they, you know, they've been on therapy, they know what they expect with the therapy they've already been on, now they're getting something new and unusual, uh, and that can be terrifying, and that is, that is a risk that comes with it. I don't think commitment's a risk, but it is something that we have to uh, include as, um, you know, these trials can be burdensome, burdensome to patients, uh, and so there is a, a long-term commitment, not just from the patient, but from the clinical team taking care of that patient as well as they're enrolled in a clinical trial. But I think the benefits, for the most part, have, are, are why we do these clinical trials. why someone like me is a researcher. It helps us find new therapies. It hopefully finds patients who can benefit from these new therapies. It allows us to advance the field of medicine, specifically in this situation, advance the field of cancer, 
and hopefully it makes patients in long term um, healthier. Am I talking too slow or too fast? I should have asked that a long time ago. I'm sorry. Um, so, so I, I want to make sure I cover everything, but of course, there's time for questions later. But in terms of the protection of participants, we talked about the ethics board already. They do review the trial, and I can tell you from personal experience, they will ask the tough questions. They will ask you, why is this good for a patient? Why is it not good for a patient? What risk are you putting them through? Uh, even if I want to draw an extra sample of blood, you know, you need to make sure that it makes sense. And I think that they are the biggest advocate of making sure we do things in a safe and ethical way for patients. Um, it is the job of the research, research ethics, ethics board. Um, so we all have to go through them, whether we like it or not, they're always there. And I think um, they have become more strict, more strict over the years, and I think that's totally fair because therapies are getting more complicated, they're getting more confusing, I think, to patients, and they are the ones, I think, protecting patients at the end of the day. Informed consent we talked about because patients and families should really understand what they're getting into. Um, the, and, and that document sort of helps protect the participants from uh, hopefully being too surprised by um, risks from the, from the therapy that they're getting. And in the informed consent, we often talk specifically about expected or unexpected adverse effects um, or side effects. And we don't always know all of them, so we can't predict everything. But we do try really hard to tell the patient if there's effects we've seen before the clinical trial, you know, that they understand what those are and that they're informed about them before running the trial. Um, there are, I didn't write it here, but I, I just did want to make a point about protection for patients is that there is usually a central objective party who can determine if certain adverse effects should shut down a trial. You know, if a patient or if a group of patients over time are getting very sick or unwell from a therapy, you would hope that we would shut down that trial. And the people invested in doing the clinical trial might not always be the right people to shut down that trial. So we always, especially with newer therapies, especially in the cancer world, have an external board that helps us to, um, to protect the patients. It helps us to prevent uh, trials from going on if they shouldn't. And we call that the DSMB, the Drug Safety and Monitoring Board. I think that does come up later, but I just it, it does pertain to protection of participants. We have, and, and we have oversight of the clinical trial, again, by objective measures, like Health Canada. We have, um, even the Research Ethics Board can any time audit us and come find out how we're doing and if our informed consent documents are all up to date and things like that. We follow good clinical practice, so GCP guidelines, which are basically ensuring that every physician participating in the trial and every participant um, meets a certain standard of what uh, would be considered good clinical practice. So again, that protects the patients and the participants. And like I said, we follow regulations, which is um, which is hugely beneficial because it allows patients to, and participants to be protected uh, from any sort of undue harm, I would say. So clinical trial participation is voluntary. It's completely up to you or to the participant. Um, and I think this is probably the most important thing that patients and participants really need to understand is that being part of a trial doesn't give you better care than outside of a trial in terms of um, you should never feel like you have to do it because you won't get the same adequate standard of care without it. Um, and if you, it's completely a patient's right to participate or not participate in a trial. And even if they agree to participate in a trial, it's the patient's right at any point in time to withdraw from the trial. Um, and if that happens, we, uh, you, we still expect that you will get our standard um, of care and, and what we would expect for every other patient who's not in a clinical trial, you would still get that from your healthcare team. And confidentiality is always maintained. So even if you exit the trial, we can't suddenly go tell everyone that you were part of it for a moment in time. And so we do try, we do protect patients and participants in that way. So I, I can't emphasize this enough, but I do remind everyone, talk to your healthcare team, uh, whether it's your physician or other people in terms of asking questions and getting more information, you're going to hear today about uh, resources that will definitely help in accessing clinical trials for patients. Um, but I tell patients all the time, you are your own best advocate because uh, I, you know, I, I only know what I know. And as a physician, I can't possibly know every trial that's out there. We do have a much bigger country south of our, well, not bigger, but we have a country full of clinical trials south of us, um, and patients often you know, want to hear about things, and I just cannot know everything. Um, and so if a patient comes to me with something that they've seen that I haven't heard about, 
I go out of my way to make sure that I find out about it or I find out if it's any benefit to my patient. Um, and all cancer patients should feel that they can access their physicians in that way to get them to find out more if, they, if the physician doesn't know about it. So ask questions, be your own advocate, and really um, that will help anybody who can be eligible for a trial get to the trial that might work for them or might be good for them. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Natasha. I'll just uh, make a quick note and say that we will open the room for questions to the speakers at the end of the webinar. And so uh, for those who have joined us online virtually, just indicate that you have a question that you wish to ask uh, using the software, and we'll, we'll relay that to the speakers. So now I'm going to pass it over to Faye, and she's going to, to tell us about uh, coordination of clinical trials and what to expect. Uh, thank you for inviting me to attend this webinar. You'll see throughout my presentation that many of the points that Natasha made, I will be making as well. So this is the uh, coordination of clinical trials and what the patient can expect. Um, I'll just give you a brief agenda of who we are. The clinical trial is part of the research process, steps to activating a protocol, uh, patient enrollment, and ongoing participation. A brief overview of the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Program. We're a comprehensive cancer treatment facility with medical, radiation, surgical, oncology, hematology, oncology um, a program that we're embedded in a large academic health science center. And we have affiliations with the University of Ottawa, which is a teaching hospital the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And our patient care is divided into disease site-specific practices. We have our investigational new drug team, our lung team, breast, gastrointestinal, genitourinary, gynae-oncology, and many of the smaller disease site groups as well. So how do we become involved in a clinical trial? A sponsor or an individual oncologist developed a concept and a protocol to answer research question. And the protocol is developed with the following in mind. Does the study ask an important scientific question? Will it be beneficial to our patients? Do we have the patient population? Are there competing studies? So the steps to activating uh, the clinical trial, trial selections, our oncologists work together in a multidisciplinary team that study specific types of cancer. So as I said, there's medical, radiation, surgical, oncologists, hematologists, pathologists, radiologists, etc. And together, they decide which clinical trials are beneficial for the patient population. Each trial, and protocol is re reviewed by the disease site. It goes through an internal review committee through the research ethics board and, if applicable, bodies of Health Canada or the Federal Drug Agency in the United States. So the most important aspect of our clinical research is the protocol and any relevant materials must be approved by our research ethics board prior to any participant becoming involved in the trial. All study materials must be approved by the OMB, and of course, this will include the consent form, patient diaries, patient quality of life questionnaires, and the review ensures that the patient's rights, safety, and privacy are protected. Now, the research ethics board um, includes physicians, it includes lay representatives and other professionals and, and ethics specialists. Now, after we have our RED approval, the investigator has what we call a site initiation visit. And this is where all the studying staff, all the participating oncologists and departments that are involved with the study meet and to discuss and train on the appropriate aspects of the study. If a drug is involved as part of the treatment, pharmacy will prepare and prepare any materials that are required for the participant to receive treatment. 
the investigator and study coordinator in TAN, and they ensure all the study personnel are trained and ready to go. And once the site initiation visit takes place, the study coordinator will let all the staff know that the study is open to treatment. So what can the patient expect? And this is part of the informed consent process. At the patient's visit, the oncologist generally reviews the patient's chart to check if there's a clinical trial, which might be a beneficial option. And this can be done at new diagnosis, where there's progressive disease, or when there is a change in treatment. The patient can also ask the oncologist about the potential clinical trial. The investigator briefly explains the study to the patient, and if the patient is interested, the clinical study coordinator is called. Now, the study coordinator will meet with the patient, discuss the study, and review the informed consent form and any other materials the patient may need to be aware of. And the informed consent is a critical part of ensuring the participant's safety in research. Uh, the patient in our institutions generally is at home with it and given time to review it and discuss with family members, family physicians, et cetera. The study coordinator gives the patient their contact information if there's any questions. And also, the informed consent is an ongoing process throughout the study. Patients are informed of any new information. And as Natasha stated, a patient can withdraw their consent at any time for any reason. Now, once the patient is enrolled and eligible, once all the questions are answered and the patient agrees to participate, they sign the informed consent, they receive a copy, and at that point in our institution, that's where the study coordinator and the investor, investigator can begin to order the study specific tests and review the eligibility criteria in detail. So this is basically what they review. They review the medical records for past history, for diagnostic testing. Most of the studies, the eligibility criteria is very in-depth and it requires testing at very specific time points. Uh, so past diagnostics may need to be repeated in CT scans, MRIs, blood work, and all this information is listed in the consent form step-by-step step as to what the patients uh, can expect. Many of our studies require a sample from the patient's original biopsy, and at times a fresh biopsy may be required. And the biopsies are often used to look at uh, study biomarkers. When all the tests are completed and reviewed, to determine if the patient meets the eligibility criteria, the participant will be informed if he or she meets or does not meet the criteria. If they meet the criteria and agree to continue on, they are enrolled in the trial. So once the participant is enrolled, further visits are scheduled. As I said, there's treatment trials that could be drug, radiation, a medical device, surgery, or ongoing diagnosis to assess the response or results. Um, the ongoing participation, the participant will need to have various tests performed at specific time points. And generally, the study coordinator coordinates this all and will quite often escort the patient to the various areas in the department so that they become familiar how to get there. We're a large institution connected by many corridors. <laughs> and um, the participant will be monitored closely for any side effects and if the treatment is beneficial. Once the treatment portion of the clinical trial is over, the patient generally continues to be monitored at specific time points with specific tests. And for some of our trials, this could be for many years. Um, the ongoing participation, all the required data that is collected is generally entered into an electronic database. Patient's personal information is not used. Patients have a code identifier. The patients are always informed of any sub, uh, safety updates and of any changes to the protocol. And this is usually done by reviewing an REV approved updated informed consent and having it signed. If a patient has finished the clinical trial, once all the treatments and procedures and visits are completed, 
And as we said, any time the participant may decide to discontinue participation. If the investigator feels the file is no longer beneficial, he or she will discuss this with the participant and review other options. And if the participant is experiencing a toxic effect, the investigator may stop the treatment. And at times, we have had the sponsor stop the study early. And again, for a couple of reasons, generally that uh, the trial proves successful at an early stage or it proves that it's not beneficial, then they'll stop the study at an early stage. Um, clinical trials, we consider a critical part of the research progress, process. Clinical trials help to move basic scientific research from the laboratory to treatment. Through clinical trials, we can better treat, we can find better treatments and ways to prevent, detect, and treat cancer. And we need to test the best cancer prevention, detection, and treatment ideas in the shortest time possible. And this can only happen if more participate in clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faye. Uh, we are going to turn it over to Jill. She's going to present some of her experiences with the followers. Thank you. My name is Jill Hamer Wilson, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my cancer journey, my experience on a clinical trial, and some of the things that I've learned through my experience and that of others. I have no medical training or background. I'm simply sharing my story as a cancer patient. What I've learned, though, is that things are changing rapidly in terms of treatment and survival rates for many types of cancer right now. There's a lot of exciting research happening and clinical trials are extending lives significantly. I'm alive today because of the grace of God and because of a clinical trial which received funding from the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation. I'm originally from Ottawa. I have degrees in engineering, theology, and education. I married an Australian musician and we have three children. We're a musical family and we used to be a very active family too. I was always very healthy, a non-smoker who took care of my body. So it was a complete shock when uh, I learned that my lingering cough after a cold was actually lung cancer. I was diagnosed back in 2013 on a Thursday, we told the kids in a gut-wrenching conversation over the weekend, and the next Tuesday, I started IV chemotherapy. I was on IV chemo for about four months. It helped a bit, but it wore my body out, and pretty soon the cancer started growing again. I took a newly developed chemo pill, a targeted therapy for my particular kind of lung cancer. It helped for about 10 months, but then the cancer progressed and I needed some other kind of treatment again. Researchers are working hard to develop better treatments that are much more effective at attacking cancer and so much easier on the body. Clinical trials are part of the process of getting new drugs to the people who need them, and they can make a life and death difference for people like me. I joined a clinical trial for an experimental or investigational drug called seritinib in May 2015. And we rejoice that in the fall of 2015, my CT scans showed absolutely no evidence of cancer. That was an unexpected gift for which we continue to give thanks. If it were not for the seritinib and this local clinical trial, my story would have been very different. These new targeted treatments do not tend to last very long, though. Generally, after a number of months or years, the cancer changes and starts to grow again, which is why more research is needed. Um, we got some sad news in January of 2017 that my scans showed progression. So it was time for another switch. We are so thankful that a new drug, electinib, 
had recently become available to people in Canada who met some particular criteria. And thankfully, I met those criteria. We are also thankful that the drug is currently available free of charge on compassionate release from this pharmaceutical company. And the best news of all is that I've been on Electinib for about four and a half months, and it seems to be working for me. If you're interested in learning more about my cancer story, I blog at throughthevalley23.wordpress.com. I only update it about once a month or when people start to harass me about how I'm doing. Thank you. Um, so clinical trials are a way for some people to gain access to new drugs before they're available by prescription. And this is critical for people like me. There's so much cutting edge research on my particular type of lung cancer. And clinical trials are such an important part of that research. Participating in the clinical trial for seritinib gave me better health for all those months and carried me through long enough for another life extending drug to become available for me. I'm thankful beyond words for these months of better health. This new drug that I'm on is helping me to feel better than I felt since before my diagnosis. I'm able to get more exercise and I'm not so exhausted all the time. I'm still dealing with some of the lingering side effects from previous treatments, but this current med has far fewer side effects than any of the other ones. I'm hoping it'll last a long too. There's never a good time to have lung cancer or any kind of cancer, but right now there's so much research and there's so many new options. And as was mentioned before, researchers are coming up with all kinds of ideas and combinations. Targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and sometimes even old-fashioned IV chemotherapies are, are, are just combined in new and creative ways in an ongoing attempt to cure cancer. We never know what will work, and clinical trials are an opportunity to try something that just might work very well. Clinical trials are helping me to have hope. I want to celebrate many more birthdays with family and friends. I'd love to see my kids grow up and even my grandchildren. So every day is a gift. I don't know how many more I'll have, but I want to make the most of each one. And I hope that these new drugs will help extend my life for many years. So I'll give you a couple more details about the clinical trial that I participated in. It was for an investigational drug called seritinib, which is a targeted therapy for the kind of lung cancer that I have, which is called ALK+, A-L-K. There were three arms of the trial that I was on, and they were studying, and forgive me if I get this a little wrong, those, that paperwork, oh my goodness, I'll get to more of that later, but um, they, were, they were trying to understand um, the effect of taking uh, different doses and whether taking it with food would affect um, the way the body is able to process the medicine uh, or not, the bioavailability of the medicine. So I took three pills every morning with a low-fat, low-calorie breakfast. Initially, I was a little bit concerned since it was a lower dose than other people had typically taken. And I don't know what the results were of this clinical trial, but I do know that these days, that was about two years ago, and these days, um, most people take this drug at a lower dose with uh, food. So probably it was a good arm that I was on, but you never know when you start, right? So some of the costs involved for me. I had to sign an agreement. Now, I'm well-educated. English is my first language. But that paperwork was long and hard to understand. The language was unfamiliar, and it's an emotional time. So no matter how much people say ask questions, I think you still never can process it all. We need help. So I, I asked people to help me understand it, and I asked a lot of questions, still didn't process it all. But I signed it anyway. <laughs> um, so I had to pay attention to the food that I ate in the morning and the timing of it every day and keep a diary. In the beginning, I had a few really long days of testing in the hospital. 
Um, and then, so every three weeks, I had to go in for a bunch of uh, of appointments, and I had to do a bunch of tests. I had blood drawn two days in a row every three weeks, plus an ECG, um, which wasn't painful really, but not really pleasant either. Um, and sometimes I started to wonder about the radiation and the cumulative effect of all those extra tests. So the issue with the blood being drawn two days in a row, that's what the protocol said had to happen. Uh, I asked very graciously, I don't know how many months in, but after a while, I started thinking, why am I having blood drawn two days in a row? I'm sure there was a reason for it, but I couldn't understand it. And so I just asked something like this. I have no medical expertise, but I don't understand why I have to have blood drawn two days in a row. Could you either draw both lots on the same day, please, or explain to me, help me understand why it set up the way it was? Well, apparently, quite a number of people had several hours of discussion about this, and eventually they decided that, that yes, actually, they could do it all at once. And it was such a relief, all of a sudden my world changed. I only had to go into the hospital one day every three weeks. I had all my appointments together, only one poke, which maybe doesn't seem like a big deal, but you start, you know, really not looking forward to getting your blood drawn again. Anyway, I don't know why I didn't ask sooner. I just never really thought about it because sometimes we, and I think maybe especially Canadians and maybe especially Canadian women, I'm not sure, but anyway, we tend to just do what we're supposed to do sometimes. I'm glad I thought about it and I'm glad I asked graciously. I was very aware that there were probably reasons that I didn't understand, but thankfully it worked out. Anyway, um, there was also an emotional cost going in so often kept reminding me that I was a cancer patient. And sometimes I just want to live my life, you know? Sometimes denial can be a good thing. <laughs> but I have to say, I really like my oncologist and I enjoy chatting with him. But I saw him way more often than I would have seen him if I had not been on a clinical trial. And that would have actually been a very high price if I didn't like my oncologist. Um, I also met with a clinical trial coordinator every three weeks to discuss all possible side effects and symptoms. So that makes for some long days about uncomfortable topics. The benefits, I mean, they're obvious. It extended my life for two plus years. I met some really lovely people, including terrific nurses and clinical trial coordinators who I got to know and grew to love. I felt very safe and cared for uh, in that company, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, because my blood work, et cetera, was checked so much more often, things were caught more quickly. Like, for example, I had low potassium one time, and uh, so I started eating more, you know, potatoes and bananas, and I was fine. And also progression was caught quicker, too, before I was even aware of it with my symptoms. Um, they also paid for my parking, which helped, you know, long days at the hospital it can get expensive. Perhaps there were benefits to other patients. I don't know about that, but I hope there were. Um, perhaps it helps to get approval for the drug in Canada. I know there are many steps in the process. It might have made a difference, but for me, obviously the main advantage is that I'm still alive. My children, uh, at the time of diagnosis were 12, 10, and 6. When I started my clinical trial, they were 14, 12, and 8. And now they're 16, 13, and 10. I'm really grateful for that. Those years mean a lot. Um, I thought you might like some advice from others. I'll just run through it quickly. A lot of things have been said here. I'm part of some patient forums online, so I've met some amazing people through that and through um, lung cancer groups. So um, I, I put the question out to them. I said, what did you wish you knew before you started the clinical trial? And I got a lot of answers. So um, just for time, I'm going to try to be a little quick here. 
They said, it's important to have an, an oncologist who is up to date and whom you trust. Don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. Know your rights. You can withdraw from the trial at any time, and the trial may not be the best option for you. Also, once they've collected enough data, sometimes they can be a lot more flexible with the appointments. It can take a long time to get through the process before starting the trial, so be aware of that. Are you thinking about having a family in the future? Ask questions about contraception and also about freezing sperm or eggs. Um, there are a lot of different conditions which exclude you from eligibility, a wide variety of things. Ask about that. Be aware that there may be a washout period between drugs when you're off medication. And even if the drug you're on now is um, not stopping the cancer from growing, it may be affecting it. It may be slowing its growth. So sometimes there are flare-ups. I don't know if there's a technical term for that. But uh, sometimes your symptoms get way worse. Um, consider what Consider practicalities and logistics, your willingness to travel, perhaps even to another country. Some of the costs may be subsidized by the sponsor and some will be out of pocket. Do your own research and make sure you know the rules. Um, one patient I spoke with, or heard from I should say, was misquoted trial requirements and it could have been really dangerous for that person. So get a friend or family member to help. And if you have a new diagnosis, don't start any med until you're evaluated for a trial because sometimes if you even just take a little bit of something, it can um, mean you're not qualified any longer for the trial. So thank you. And then a t-shirt my husband had made. Mm -hmm. He ran uh, as a fundraiser in the marathon a year ago to raise money for clinical trials. And that's a picture of me holding my middle child. I don't think I could do that now. It's almost as tough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel. Excuse me. We really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Just a couple of follow-up questions. What surprised you the most about participating in a clinical trial? I think the thing that surprised me the most was how much I grew in appreciation of the nurses and the clinical trial coordinator with whom I met every three weeks. I actually really miss them. I've gone back to visit. And uh, can you tell us about your first visit and how you felt? I was really nervous, um, even afraid. I had no idea if the treatment would work or how it would affect me. And I had a terrible experience actually while I was driving to the hospital for my first long day of testing. I nearly got um, hit by a huge truck. And so I was, like, I was emotional already even before I left, and that happened, and I was really shaky, and I could just feel my emotions <laughs> right near the surface. And then I was coughing quite a lot because it's lung cancer, and that's normal. And this man in the change room, and on the change room, excuse me, in the waiting room, started yelling at me because I was coughing, and he didn't want to catch whatever I had. And I was trying to reassure him, and he yelled at me even more. And I just burst into tears. And when the nurses found out about this, they just gathered around me like mama bears. And they wanted to just take him down. You know? <laughs> so, um, so I tell you, it was, uh, it was very unusually emotional. But again, it was the beginning of feeling their love and support. And what would you recommend to someone to help them prepare when they meet with their doctor to talk about participating in a trial? Yeah. Well, as has been said, it's important to do your research, but it's also really hard, especially because probably the time when you might need a trial is when um, your your symptoms, your cancer has progressed, and so it's an emotional time. So I think the most important thing to do is to have a team around you, have friends, family members, cancer coaches, people who will help you do some research people who don't have brain fog. Often people say, how can I help? Well, sometimes it's best to have friends who aren't that close to you, but who are good researchers, 
we all know people who are good researchers. Even if they don't have a background in medicine, they might be able to help out in this way. Um, so it, they don't need to be in a medical field, but if you know someone, that's a bonus. So prepare a list of questions and bring it with you. Go over it with a friend in advance and ask your friend to come with you. And each of you have a copy. Ask your friend, tell your friend her job is to help you remember to ask all the important questions and to write down the answers for you. Uh, cancer patients need a team to help. Um, the other thing I would say is when you're doing your research, online forums can be really helpful, but be careful. You know, they can be hit or miss. Be wise. Um, and one question I really like, I always ask my oncologist right from the beginning, I said, if your friend or family member was in this situation, what would you recommend? Because I want to get real advice from them. And I don't know if my doctor has given me better advice because of that, but I've asked him a few times, you know, if your friend or family member was in this situation, what would you recommend? What questions would you ask? What uh, concerns would you have? And what advice uh, do you have? Well, consider the costs and benefits for you. You're going to have to make a decision without knowing everything. Um, but ask for what you need. Ask lots of questions. Ask people to write it down for you. In a pinch, ask your oncologist to write down for you and at least to write down the words that you didn't quite catch because we're not going to catch it all, right? But get help. Ask for resources, and I know there are a lot of resources available. We're going to go over that, I think, next. So ask for help. Look for the resources. And these decisions can come up quickly, often in times of crisis, so as much as possible, try to do some of that research and build your support team before you need it, in case there is a time when you need it. Thank you very much, um, Jill, for sharing your insights and your story. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, my honor. And now I'd like to turn to Don and Faye to talk about uh, resources. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, Jill. So I'm first going to um, present some resources that N2 has developed, and these are publicly available. So um, we've started a bit of, I'll say, uh, it's called a, a campaign almost. It's called It Starts With Me. And it's really about um, trying to increase the dialogue um, about clinical research and clinical trials. And there is a website here that's noted on the um, slide, www.itstartswithme.ca. And I'm going to walk you um, through this resource a little bit. And to um, our um, Clinical Trials Education and Awareness Committee undertook to build this website. Um, we started about two years ago. It took about one year. And our um, committee, who are filled with um, clinical research professionals, as well as a number of patients and caregivers, that represented people from coast to coast of all different ages, many different types of diseases, uh, worked with us on building this web page so that we could be sure we'd built um, a robust resource that people would find useful and they would find it easy to navigate and read. And I'll just walk you through a little bit about what the website looks like and hopefully you'll find this to be a helpful resource. So this is the home page of the website. The website is available both in English and French. So the URLs are at the top of the page here. And there's a short video on the website, which I'll come back and talk about a little bit later as well. And you can see across the top of the page, there are different um, statements. So why participate, how it works, getting started, and FAQ. And we're going to just go through um, each of those pages over the next few minutes here, just so that you can see uh, what they look like. So the first um, page is why participate. And what this page really does is 
it um, helps a person understand why they might consider clinical trials and a little bit about how clinical trials are really um, research and how this is the first time that um, therapies or interventions have been used um, with people and the different types that there may be. So how it works is what clinical trials are. So it's really the types of um, different trials, um, like um, Dr. Keckry walked us through earlier, and it's also the different phases of clinical trials that are explained here as well. Um, since we worked with um, uh, some participants as well as just patients in general and caregivers to develop the site, um, you'll notice when you go on it that it's in um, hopefully very readable language. So we've tried not to use a lot of medical terms or acronyms throughout the site, but used really um, easy to understand and read language. The next um, page is getting started. So this talks a little bit about um, some of the risks and benefits you might ask about if you're considering a clinical trial. There's a downloadable page of questions, again, that you might um, consider. And um, it also tells you a little bit about the protections that are afforded to participants, which we've talked about as well throughout the webinar. I did want to note as well that the pictures of people that you see, for example, the picture on this um, page, um, these are actual healthcare professionals and some real patients and volunteers at hospitals. So there's some stock photos on the website, but some of the photos have been used um, with permission from um, some of N2's members as well. I think this particular one actually may have come from the Ottawa Hospital. So this last um, page is um, kind of the catch-all for the website. So you'll notice at the bottom of the page, um, there are four different tabs. Um, so there's glossary, there's participating, creating trials, and general. So while we've tried to build the site um, without a lot of medical jargon, sometimes there are still terms that we can't avoid. And so what we've done is we've linked those terms to the glossary that's found on the website. And the glossary helps explain a bit more about what those terms are and what they mean. The participating tab is a lot of questions that we've collected from participants and caregivers. Um, and um, Jill has gone over some of the questions that she's asked. Some of those are found here as well with some answers to them. There's a bit of information about who creates trials and how they come up with the questions for those. Again, Dr. Keckry talked a lot about that. And then there's a general tab that's got some other information, some other links for you that you might be interested in. So that's a bit about the website in general. Um, on the home page of the site, there is a short video. It's about a minute long. Um, I think we're going to skip showing that so that we can get to questions. But the, it's on um, N2's YouTube channel, which is listed here. It's, about, it's available both in English and French, and it's available with and without subtitles. So anyone can go onto our YouTube channel and see this. And for N2 members specifically, they can have access to the video itself. But you might find it helpful. It's a bit of a call to action. It's a little bit of a primer about what clinical trials are and basically getting people to think about them as, an, as potential options. Um, N2 has also developed a pamphlet. Um, the, both there's an English and French version, which are shown here, at least the, it's a it's a trifold, so the first page of, e of the trifolds are shown here. You'll notice that um, it's very much in line with how our website looks. And again, it's really just a very basic overview of clinical trials. So this might be a resource that you may be interested in downloading. It's available um, free at um, the N2 Canada web, uh, website. And um, it answers just some really basic questions for people about clinical trials and some questions also that they might wish to ask when they're considering these, um, to ask their healthcare professionals or others about them. And um, lastly, um, these links here are ones that N2 and its members 
um, have uh, agreed to put on our website, it starts with me.ca, about the places where you might find clinical trials. So you can obviously ask your healthcare team, your physician. Health Canada does have a clinical trials uh, database. There's also an international standard uh, registered clinical um, social study number or ISRCTN website. The World Health Organization has a site and you might be familiar with um, Canadian cancer trials and clinicaltrials.gov is uh, referenced a lot. Also, um, when we were preparing for um, the webinar today, um, Dr. Kekri reminded us that a lot of disease-specific societies will also have links to clinical trials on their website. So, for example, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, the um, Myeloma Canada, they will often have links to trials um, specific to their uh, cancer types as well. But these are kind of the um, main ones where you may um, go to to um, search for trials. Um, the caveat is they're not always the easiest to search, so sometimes you might need help, but these are the main um, sources of information. And I think the next slide, I'll pass it back to Faye. She's going to talk about some very um, specific resources at the Ottawa Hospital that you might be interested in as well. Yes, thank you. Um, at the Ottawa Hospital, I did uh, go through the powers to be, and we did have the uh, Start With Me brochures printed out, and I brought a number of them here in French and English. And uh, they're distributed throughout the uh, Cancer Centre as well as in the Patient Resource Centre. And the N2 video, um, we do have it playing on the TV screens. We have TV screens in each of the patient's waiting rooms, so we do have the N2 video, Pioneer French and English, on the screens um, within the Cancer Centre. As well, uh, there are a number of resources for patients, but again, it's a matter of trying to find resources. The Ottawa Hospital Research Institute has the website and there is a patient link that you can go to that again brings you to many of the different links where you can find resources, as well as the Ottawa Hospital uh, Library, the Cancer Center Library. They develop the very um, patient-centered area within their portal and you can link on clinical trials and it'll bring you to many uh, resources as well. As well, we got them to put the It Starts With Me video and campaign on at that particular portal. So as I said, there is a physical resource at the uh, Patient Resource Center at the Ottawa uh, Hospital Cancer Center at the General Campus, the Canadian Cancer Society, Canadian Cancer Clinical Trials, Ontario Cancer Clinical Trials, as well as if you're interested in U.S. trials, there's the National Cancer Institute list of clinical trials, and all those have their websites linked within this uh, web portal. And again, if you're an oncologist, your physician, surgeon, hematologist, there's an excellent resource as well. Thank you so much, uh, Faye and, and John, for this. I would like to now open for questions to our guest speakers from the room. And for those joining us online, please just indicate that you have a question uh, through the web and our web chat. And we can uh, either and we'll open the call or we'll, we'll, surface, we'll bring your question to the, to the room. Um, a question to the uh, panelists. This is Denny Raymond talking. Um, I was wondering uh, what would the process, or what does the process uh, look like? Uh, for international clinical trials um, being or becoming accessible here in Ottawa? We, we do deal with many international clinical trials within the Cancer Center. Uh, we work with many uh, worldwide uh, trials, and particularly as you were mentioning, your phase three trials, which uh, require a large number of patients. Uh, they tend to be uh, to be worldwide. So we work very closely also with our U.S. partners as well as uh, European, etc. Uh, 
so the uh, it starts with me campaign sounds really neat. I'm going to do some reading up on that. Typically, right now, is there a certain way that most patients are finding clinical trials? Like, is it more often physician recruitment? Is are people self-referring? Is there a top one or two or how? Um, yeah, I would say it depends on the disease probably. Um, you know, in in my world, it's probably still a physician that's mostly um, initiating, although we have, you know, a few things that have made the news recently, so patients are aware of things that are out there. Um, and I think, you know, I hear I hear about them all, all the time that way. Uh, but I would say majority of clinical trials from for our patients, at least in the hematology and cancer world, is uh, initiated by the physician. Um, I was going to ask, and Jill touched a little bit on it, and that, but for me as a cancer coach, the hardest ones I have are like there's certain diseases where the standard of care, like they come into you ready for clinical trials because the standard of care isn't isn't great, right? Um, so, um, so the issue is not convincing them to do clinical trials, but where they come is like, and I have this question on Friday with the client, like, how do I know, like? Like they feel like it's their full, suddenly it's their full time job, which you talked about when they're at a really weak point of figuring it out themselves of all the clinical trials. They don't feel confident that something's not being missed or like who's responsible. And they're surprised almost that it's their responsibility <laughs> to figure that out when they are new, like they're just new to this, or, or you know, they're not the experts, they're not health professionals or whatever. So I as a, need tips to help empower them because I can't be an expert. And even you're saying, well, I can't keep it on top of it, right? So they will say, you know, I had a, a gentleman the other day whose wife has like uh, glioblastoma. Which, so he says, well, I'm trying to decide, and he's really smart and everything. How much like do I want to spend I, all my time researching clinical trials, or do I want to spend my time with her and for the best quality of life? But he said he's frustrated that. If, if he doesn't do that, it's going to be missed, right? Or a thing. So, so he says, "Can I trust that my doctor knows what's going on?" Like it, it's, it's. So that I guess it asks, like, what are some tips, or how do we empower people to do that, right? To, to make sure they're not missing things. That would be one of my questions. To make that easier. Right? Well, again, your oncologist is generally be the first contact in that within the cancer center they are aware of what types of trials are being run in the cancer center plus uh, across Canada. And there's not always a clinical trial for every patient. And it, it is difficult because you do rely a, a lot on your oncologist and your oncologist knowledge and being forceful with them and that you want to know if there are clinical trials available. And if not, in Ottawa, are they, is it available elsewhere? And they're generally very much aware of what type of trials are available. But again, yeah, many times the patients are researching. Mm -hmm. Well, that's difficult. Yeah. In, in my community, in the lung cancer community, especially with all these new advances, mm -hmm. there are a lot of patients who are so knowledgeable and so supportive and eager to share what they've learned. So mm -hmm. If you can get people connected to people who know what's going on, or maybe um, some sort of organization like Lung Cancer Canada, whichever one would be specific to your yeah. mm -hmm. um, there can be resources there too. Similar to um, what Tani talked about, um, I've also had clients who, you know, are have a really hard diagnosis, and who, you know, when they get to a point where the treatment doesn't work anymore, I'll ask them about, you know, about clinical trials, and they haven't always gotten that information, so they're doing a lot of that research themselves. And something that Jill brought up um, is when you read the consent forms, but also when you read, like, I often go to enter a cancer trial, which is great resource where you can look up, you know, by type of cancer and what city you're in. But when you read the information on clinical trials, it's very, very medical. It is. So any any suggestions on how to help clients access information that's really kind of you know, easier to read? Mm -hmm. This is well, 
the consent forms are, are supposed to be at a, a grade 8 level, but even then there are terms that you may not be familiar with. And I think particularly in the French con consent forms that it would be more difficult for our mm -hmm. Francophone patients. Um, again, it's, it's asking your oncologist to explain things or the clinical study coordinator mm -hmm. to explain things. And we're trying to bring forth more information for patients that is easier to find. Because many times, as you said, there are so many different websites and some of it may not be all that updated or there's medical terms which they they don't understand. It's, you know, it's a difficult disease and and it can be quite a quagmire trying to, to find your way in what treatment is best. Another question I had, this may be more appropriate for you, um, is for someone with a very advanced cancer, there are times when you guys say, okay, no, this isn't going to help anymore. Um, so a couple of assumptions I just want to clear up about clinical trials, because I think it's important for you guys as, as coaches. Um, we don't have to do a clinical trial just when a patient is out of other options. And often we do them earlier. And I think that patients don't think about it till it is very much at the end, uh, when it can be, you know, emotionally very, very difficult to put that time in at that time. So I'm, I just want to make that point. I think it's important that our patients have a, especially in cancers where we know the outcomes are poor, as you, you said, some, you know, often patients do know that early. Um, you know, it's important that we, the medical community, do a better job, I think, of, um, thinking and planning ahead, uh, which I, you know, I do a lot, but it's difficult for my patients for them to think of that. You know, I'm planning very difficult therapies, like a bone marrow transplant, for example, but I'm already telling them, you know, if, if this doesn't work, we need to think about other options. I'm already applying for paperwork, or I'm already keeping them informed. So one thing to mention about that. The second thing is, you're right, there's a lot of patients who, when they run out of options, is when they can enroll into a trial. Um, and it depends on where we are at the stage of that trial for me to say what we would do. And this is true for most oncologists. I think if we know that that therapy has been shown to be somewhat tolerable, uh, then, you know, I might, when I talk to the patient, I, I would say what we think we know already about that therapy. If it's a therapy where we either don't know anything about what it's going to be, it's completely a phase one, or two, we know it is a difficult therapy to administer. You know, I think it's really important that patients and physicians have a frank discussion about it. So my patients will tell you I'm very blunt and I think they deserve that because I think some of these clinical trials are a lot of effort mm -hmm. for everybody involved. And I think that, you know, physicians will not realize that a patient needs to come in two days in a row um, for blood work. I'm about to run a trial where patients have to come in every three hours to get their to get pulp. Um, and it's only going to be for the first 10 patients, but it's because we need to see what the drug is doing, how it's being metabolized, how it's being broken down in the body, and we don't always have that information. Um, so it's very cumbersome, uh, to say the least. And, you know, patients who don't know if they're going to have any benefit, who might be in their last moments of life, it can be very difficult. And so I tell patients it's an individual decision, but I think that quality has to, you know, take over at that point, quality of life. And I think that if things are near the end and it's a therapy that really has no known anything, uh, or it is known to be a very risky procedure, meaning it comes with a lot of side effects. I do, I do try, I think we can try better to tell patients to think about that part too, and not just the potential of a few more days if it's not going to be good days. You know? And so I think um, we don't talk enough about the quality of life in some of these things. And I think as coaches, as patients, uh, like I've said over and over again, ask those tough questions, you know, make those tell the patients to ask those tough questions. Again, they're their best advocate. And if they say, you know, I want I want this quality of life that I have now for as long as I can, then they need to ask their physician, do you think that this is a therapy mm -hmm. that you would give to your brother if he was super sick or your family member? And I think that's something you have to think about. And, you know, I think most oncologists were pretty comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations, uh, but you sometimes just need to ask. They might not think of it that way. Um, and then one last thing is, I just wanted to go back to the point about um, uh, what you said about, or what you said sort of about trusting a physician. I think it's a really tough one. Um, 
and I think that I think that you're right. There's a lot out there. I do think that at academic centers, because I, I do think community doctors are limited by what's available to them. So I do think once a patient reaches an academic center, um, physicians at that academic center generally know what is available for patients. So I might not know about a phase one trial in San Francisco that a patient's going to have to pay a million dollars to get to. I won't. But I will know what is available actually for patients in Ottawa for the cancer that they have. And I think that unfortunately you do have to have that trust in that your physician in an academic center at the very least knows about what research and what is being done in that field. Um, and we generally have that threshold. We expect that in academic physicians. It is difficult in the community because they don't necessarily have access to the same resources or the same network that I have access to. Um, and so if a patient's in community and coming to you in a smaller hospital, I would say that that patient should ask their physician if they can be referred to a bigger center if they're thinking about a trial and they don't seem to know what's out there and they feel like they're not sure. Not because those community docs don't try to know that knowledge, they do, but they're just not exposed to it in the same way that an academic physician would be. Um, because they have so many more patients, they have a, they have a very different focus, I would say. Um, so a lot of separate patients come to Ottawa for an opinion for me, a lot of all other patients come down to us. And that's not uncommon, and, and we would happily tell them what's available and what we think could possibly be eligible for. Yeah. I do think that I think thinking of some of the clients I've coached and worked with, and and some of the myths and misconceptions or worries that they have, and and particularly clients who have a rare cancer that's not maybe that we don't see as many cases of in Ottawa in a year, and they'll often sort of be saying, "Well, I just don't." You know, I'm not sure that my team is as familiar. You know, do I go to a bigger center to get to to get more? You know, to get to be even to find a clinical trial on that? Do you see that Um So I do bone marrow transplant, which inherently is a rare entity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know, I I do we only do maybe a hundred in Ottawa a year, and I train in a center that does six hundred in a year. So I I do understand where patients are coming from, but. Um, I try not to get, I don't like, I don't want patients to get down the road of what I could get elsewhere. Um, I think I try to focus them on the training and the positions that they have and the trust in the team that they have. It does help when they like their oncologist or they have a good relationship with them. You know, I, I don't have a difficult time explaining that uh, when patients now, it's easy for me because I'm trained in a center that, that has all the, I know that's not always true, but um, you know, it's not, when it comes to clinical trials, it's not always about the diagnosis. It's also about a new therapy, and it's going to be new whether you come here or whether you go to another center. Uh, it's not always about that rare type of cancer, and I, I think sometimes that's, it's very stressful. There's no way we can take that away. It's, it's scary no matter where you go. Um, but I, I think that you have to assume that, especially in our centers, all oncologists are specialty trained. They're not... And nowadays, they're mostly trained in the cancer they treat, not just in oncology. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it is a leap of faith no matter what. But I think, you know, trying to focus on the fact that this is new no matter where you go in a clinical trial, um, instead of focusing on how rare the, the disease really is. Kind of and what's the relationship between the person, oncologist, and the clinical investigator? Do they do they kind of change hands in their treatment, or do they stay with their oncologist and they're followed by the Yeah, team? they can maybe talk about some of the bigger trials. It really depends on the trial. I'll let you maybe say that. Uh, well, usually within our breast disease site group, we would have uh, one of the uh, oncologists would be the principal investigator of the trial, but the rest of the breast team are co-investigators, as long as you know, for medical oncology or radiation oncology, and that goes per disease uh, site group that uh, all the oncologists within that are generally participating and are investigators or co-investigators within the protocol. And my other question is, what happens when they deviate from the timeline of the trial because you know, they they got sick or their accounts mm -hmm. dropped or mm -hmm. or something happened that just was an untoward event or something. Do they automatically get not eligible or is there is there a way? No, they no. Once if you're on the study and life happens, yeah. you know, if you have a bad snowstorm, you can't make it for your CT scan. It's supposed to be done every eight weeks. And, 
you're going to do it at week nine. What happens is that um, those type of deviations are reported. If there are certain ones that meet the research ethics board criteria where we have to report it to the research ethics board if it's a, a deviation in the treatment or something that may possibly affect the safety of the patient or did affect the safety of the patient, we have to report those. But for the standard where you couldn't get your blood work done on time, your chest x-rays, CT scans done on time, they are reported within within the, the study protocol. And each one is listed well within the database that you're completing, but also we have a log per study. And the investigators who's responsible for that study at this center has to sign off on each of them so that he or she is aware. And then, then we can also look at, at trends. But there's latitude. Yes, yes. yes. I don't know. Just, is there any tool of them that might be for the N2 person or maybe for you guys in terms of just that searching, like, you know, the list like clinicaltrials.gov and all that, like that, those searches aren't easy. <laughs> I find them very difficult and I have a nursing background and mm -hmm. so like, you Definitely. know, what's the right search word to put in and we're asking clients to do that truthfully, like, right. like yeah. when they're led through the thing, it's, it's, they're told, okay, you know, and go to these sites. And so, I don't know if you know tools, even a, a webinar on how to do that, right? And what what are search words, and how do you know that you have? And I feel that's, I guess, it's part of me when I'm sort of showing them or having that you're not missing ones because you didn't put in the right search words or all of that, like that. So it's so it can it can be so and myself at times I've had trouble finding right and we're well, I have right yeah many different uh, but most of the information that we're giving them is is and the end point is go to clinicaltrials.gov or go there and then but there's no tool to help. I haven't seen. I asked if there is one and that would be helpful for me to share with clients, but to navigate that so that you feel more confident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they, I, I, again, with those difficult cancers, that, like the ones like, and, and I've had recently, like pancreatic cancer, they are searching not just here, they're searching everywhere yeah. because yeah. they are desperate. Yeah. So they're not just going to work with the teams here. Yeah. Which that's the truth. Like, they, yeah. they're, they'll, they'll, and some can't because they don't have money, but if they have any money, they're going to go wherever, right? Um, so it, that's the piece, too, where they're, how do I, you know, what if there is one that I haven't accessed? You know? Yeah, and, true. Yeah. Don, do you have any suggestions about uh, within two and the clinical trials back up? So we've heard this feedback a lot. It's something that we've considered, and I can take back to the committee, again, about coming up with um, almost like a primer as to how to best search but unfortunately right now I don't have anything I can offer you except to say that it is something that we've heard and we are considering working on. Some of the search engines have a, a, a document that explains how to search for clinical trial like they have sort of a cheat sheet that, that people I was at a dinner party a couple months ago and a very well educated person said to me who was a cancer survivor, she said, oh no, I didn't do a clinical trial because I didn't want a placebo. And I, and I was I was kind of like, my breast just caught, you know, and, and, I, and I said, well, they wouldn't not treat you, you know, they would give you the standard of care. But, but I, and then, I, you know, I realized there's a lot of misconceptions. And the other misconception I've heard from people is that, and maybe it's a bit of a more of American thing that it's, it's well, I, I, I went on, on a clinical trial because I couldn't afford the drug any other way. That was the only way I could it could be paid for, you know, so I, I wasn't really, you know, comfortable, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have insurance. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder how you address that with people so they don't feel like they're, it's still a reality in our world. Uh, there's, you know, unless it's on compassionate use, if it's not, if it's in that in-between period before compassionate use, gets approved for, with the government or it's after compassionate use and we're waiting on it to be on formulary at the hospital, it's very awkward. Um, you know, the truth is by the time I'm at a stage where I want to recommend a drug to a patient, if it's in between those phases, 
I have enough data to back up what I'm saying. Yeah. So usually when a pa I, you know, I tell patients, you know, we can't get this drug, but if you were on the trial, we could. Generally by then I have enough phase three data that there's very good efficacy and we're literally waiting on it to be Health Canada approved. Mm -hmm. We're kind you know, we're in that situation with a lot of immunotherapies right now from the US that have now come into mainstream and they're slowly gonna work their way into our market. You know, but we're not there yet. And so some patients the only way to get it is really either I have to ask the company, which we do, we usually try to get exceptional release sometimes, but sometimes it's still on the trials and you know, the truth is I open I, I often open certain pharmaceutical trials because I know those drugs work in my diseases, yeah. and the only way I can get that drug right now is to open those clinical trials. Yeah. Um, but it's just a reality we live in, and I do do try to remind patients that if I'm willing to do that and open the trial so that my patients get access to those therapies just like every patient I think should, um, then it's because I think there's a signal there already in the literature that it works. But it's, it's just a reality we work in, and there's no way around that. And in, are immunotherapies going to come down in price? Or are they, I, th I think they're both in question. <laughs> so it depends what you mean by immunotherapy. You know, immunotherapies are, there's lots of drugs where we can manipulate how our own immune response to a drug, to a, a cancer is. But there's also these therapies that are coming out of, the, that are going to come out where we manipulate a patient's own cells and give them back to a patient. And that's a very costly procedure. It remains a very costly procedure, and I don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. But when people started bone marrow transplants, you know, 40, 50 years ago, they said the same thing, and we never thought that would make it to mainstream, and it obviously did. So we'll see what happens. But I think the drugs will be just like every other. The ones that are, you know, we call them checkpoint inhibitors and a lot of immune drugs that are drugs, those presumably will get better with time, but it takes a long time. Yeah. I have one last question about, I've had a couple of clients who are doing um, alternative and complementary therapies and really hesitated about going on a clinical trial because they wouldn't be able to, even if it was something small like a supplement that they were taking, you know, do you see that in operation? So my patients mostly can't take those therapies anyways because they're post-transplant, but uh, if they were, you know, one of my former leukemia patients, um, it depends on what it is and what the patient thinks the benefit is because they have nothing right on paper. Generally, it's hard to show it on paper. The patients often feel better with those types of things. And so, again, we have a frank discussion about quality of life. And if those things they feel really are improving their quality of life, then I, you know, it's not my job to sit there and push a trial over that. Um, but I, we, I do try to have a, a discussion about it. Like if the, if they're taking that supplement because someone told them to, for example, or they saw it on TV, but they've had no difference with it, I do try to talk to them about it to get a sense of, you know, they might be missing out on another therapy. Having said that, they might not be. The new therapy might be, you know, maybe they're going to have side effects and I can't prove that. So, I, you know, it's it's one of those things. And supplements are not all created equal. And now that I, you know, my pharmacists have to review even something as simple as vitamins because there's a lot of things that are not just the vitamins in those pills and they can interact with a lot of the things mm -hmm. we use and that's the big problem. It's not so much that I that we it's unknown to us, but yeah. a lot of these supplements have interactions and that can either inhibit or make a drug stronger, one of our drugs that we're using stronger and so it can be very difficult. So, you know, I I mostly my patients will not be on supplements for that reason because they're on so many drugs in the transplant. Um, they can't take them anyways. But yeah, it can get difficult. Well, and sometimes it's about control and choice too. Yeah. Sort of feeling, you know, I want to yeah. have, yeah. I want to be able to have some. Yeah. We but do have pa patients that are on supplements that are reviewed quite closely to make sure that there's no, yeah. no interaction. Um, quite often within the protocol design, they will definitely say what supplements you cannot mm -hmm. take because there is a known interaction. Mm -hmm. For instance, mm -hmm. St. John's War, yeah. yes, so many, many of our protocols. Yeah. Well, I had someone who was doing acupuncture and they, they, they didn't think that they could continue that when they started the clinical trial. And I'm not, yeah. Yeah. So they should always specifically ask though, mm -hmm. because yes. patients, and we do it all the time too, we assume mm -hmm. when you read between the lines in the trial. Okay. You know, they, they really just need to ask the question. Uh, and sometimes they can, like, again, my patients can't use acupuncture because they're mm -hmm. needles and yeah, okay. all kinds of things like that. Okay. But other patients can very easily, and some of our mm -hmm. former trials would be no reason they couldn't. So it really, they have to just ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the cancer drugs 
really lower your white blood cell count, make you prone to infection. So, you know, again, yeah. Yeah. It's a conversation again. Yeah. Understanding, understanding why we yeah. feel, yeah. I think, like, yeah. you know, no one should ever feel like they had to give up something to be on a clinical trial, something they believe in or that mm -hmm. they're working for them to be on a clinical trial. That's the same as coercing someone into a clinical trial. So they should really feel like they're empowered to make that decision. So I think, I think with that, uh, we'll go ahead to and wrap up the webinar. Thanks, Renee. Um, on behalf of N2, I'd just like to thank you for your attention today and for um, the group of presenters that I worked with along with Renee. Um, thank you for your time and preparing for this. Um, I realized that my email and contact information were not on the slides, but Renee can provide those to you if there are any questions or comments you have about any of the N2 resources, I can certainly um, help you get access to those. Or like I said, if you have any questions or comments about them, happy to help you in that respect. Otherwise, I just hope that the session was helpful um, for you to help answer some of the questions your clients have. And I'll pass it back to Renee for um, final remarks. Thank you, Don. Um, and thank you to everyone for participating today. Uh, we will now conclude the webinar. Um, thank you again for your time and also for the time working together and developing this webinar. It has truly been a pleasure. Um, we hope that this webinar has helped answer your questions about cancer clinical trials. And like Don said, please feel free to contact us. With any further questions, we will sh I will share uh, Don's contact information with you. And uh, thank you very much.